Chapter 62, The Resurrection Man's History. I was born 38 years ago near the village of Walmer in Kent. My father and mother occupied a small cottage, or rather hovel, made of the wreck of a ship upon the sea coast. Their ostensible employment was that of fishing, but it would appear that smuggling and body snatching also formed a portion of my father's avocations. The rich inhabitants of Walmer and Deal encouraged him in his contraband pursuits by purchasing French silks, gloves, and scents of him. The gentlemen, moreover, were excellent customers for French brandy and the ladies for dresses and perfumes. The clergyman of Walmer and his wife were our best patrons in this, and in consequence of the frequent visits they paid our cottage, they took a sort of liking to me. The parson made me attend the national school regularly every Sunday. When I was nine years old, he took me into his service to clean the boots and knives, brushing the clothes and so forth. I was then very fond of reading and used to pass all my leisure time in studying books which he allowed me to take out of his library. This lasted till I was 12 years old, when my father was one morning arrested on a charge of smuggling and taken to Dover Castle. The whole neighborhood expressed their surprise that a man who appeared to be so respectable should turn out to be such a villain. The gentleman who used to buy brandy of him talked loudly of the necessity of making an example of him. The ladies, who were accustomed to purchase gloves, silks, and eau de cologne, wondered that such a desperate ruffian should have allowed them to sleep safe in their beds, and of course the, clerg the clergyman and his wife kicked me ignominiously out the door. And this, I'm just doing the math in my head, if he's 38 now, he, this would have been right in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars. And so trade with France was outlawed, but a lot of smugglers brought those goods in to England. It was a poorly kept secret that the that the British never did want for French um, uh, items during the boycott of France. So that's so about the time period we're in. As all things of this nature create a sensation in a small community, the parson preached a sermon upon the subject on the following Sunday, choosing for his text, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, and earnestly enjoined all his congregation to unite in deprecating the conduct of a man who had brought disgrace upon a neighborhood till then famed for its loyalty, its morality, and its devotion to the laws of the country. My father was acquitted for want of evidence and returned home after having been in prison six months waiting for his trial. In the meantime, my mother and myself were compelled to receive parish relief. Not one of the fine ladies and gentlemen who had been the indirect means of getting my father into a scrape by encouraging him in his illegal pursuits would notice us. My mother called upon several, but their doors were banged in her face. When I appeared at the Sunday school, the parson expelled me, declaring that I was only calculated to pollute honest and good boys. And the beetle thrashed me soundly for daring to attempt to enter the church. All this gave me a very strange idea of human nature and set me a thinking upon the state of society. Just at that period, a baronet in the neighborhood was proved to be the owner of a smuggling vessel and to be pretty deep in the contraband business himself. He was compelled to run away, an exchequer process, I think they called it, issued against his property and everything he possessed was swept away. It appeared that he had been smuggling for years and had defrauded the revenue to an immense amount. He was a widower, but he had three children, two boys and a girl, at school in the neighborhood. Oh, then, what sympathy was created for these poor, dear, bereaved little ones, as the parson called them in a charity sermon which he preached for their benefit. And there they were, marshaled into the parson's own pew by the beetle, and the parson's wife wept over them. Subscriptions were got up for them, the mayor of Deal took one boy, the banker another, and the clergyman's wife took charge of the girl, and never was seen so much weeping and consoling and compassion before." So basically, when his dad got in trouble for minor amounts of smuggling, the whole community turned against him. But when these children's father, who was a baronet, so a man with a title, was found to have been involved in massive amounts of smuggling to the point that he had to run away from the law, that man's children were embraced and upheld. And so he's telling us here a lot about the disparity within society on how they treat people based on the ranking and importance of their families. Well, at that time, my mother had got so thin and weak and ill through want and affliction that her neighbors gave her the name of the mummy, which she has kept ever since. My father came home and was shunned by everybody. The baronet's uncle happened to die at that period and left his nephew an immense fortune. The baronet paid all the fines and settled the exchequer matters and returned to Walmer. A triumphal reception awaited him. Balls, parties, concerts, and routs 
took place in honor of the event, and the mayor, the banker, and the clergyman and his wife were held up as the patterns of philanthropy and humanity. Of course, the baronet rewarded them liberally for having taken care of his children in the hour of need. This business again set me a-thinking, and I began to comprehend that birth and station made an immense difference in the views that the world adopted of men's actions. My father, who had only higgled and fiddled with smuggling affairs upon a miserably small scale, was set down as the most atrocious monster unhung because he was one of the common herd, but the baronet, who had carried on a systematic contraband trade to an immense amount, was looked upon as a martyr to, to tyrannical laws because he was one of the upper classes and possessed a title. So my disposition was soured by these proofs of human injustice at my very entrance upon life. Up to this period, in spite of the contemplation of the laws of the lawless trade carried on by my father, I had been a regular attendant at church and at the Sunday school. And I declared most solemnly that I never went to sleep at night, nor commenced my morning's avocations without saying my prayers. But when my father got into trouble, the beetle kicked me out of church, and the parson drove me out of the school, and so I began to think that if my religion was only serviceable and available as long as my father remained unharmed by the law, it could not be worth much. From that moment, I never said another prayer, and never opened a Bible or prayer book. Still, I was inclined to labor to obtain an honest livelihood, and I implored my father upon my knees not to force me to assist in his proceedings of smuggling and body snatching, to both which he was compelled by dire necessity to return the moment he was released from jail. He told me I was a fool to think of living honestly, as the world would not let me, but he added that I might make the trial. Pleased with this permission, and sincerely hoping that I might obtain some occupation, however menial, which would enable me to eat the bread of honest toil, I went round to all the farmers in the neighborhood, and offered to enter their service as a plowboy or a stable boy. The moment they found out who I was, they one and all turned me away from their doors. One said, like father, like son. Another asked if I was mad to think that I could thrust myself into an honest family. A third laughed in my face. A fourth threatened to have me taken up for wanting to get into his house to commit a felony. A fifth swore that there was gallows written upon my countenance. A sixth ordered his men to loosen the bulldog at me. And a seventh would have had me ducked in his horse pond if I had not run away. Dispirited but not altogether despairing, I returned home. On the following day, I walked into Deal, which almost joins Walmer, and called at several tradesmen's shops to inquire if they wanted an errand boy. My reception by these individuals was worse than that which I had met with at the hands of the farmers. One asked me if I thought he would run the risk of having his house indicted as the receptacle for thieves and vagabonds. A second pointed to his children and said, Do you suppose I want to bring them up in the road of the gallows? A third locked up his till in a fright and threatened to call a constable, and a fourth lashed me severely with a horsewhip. Still, I was not totally disheartened. I determined to call upon some of the ladies and gentlemen who had been my father's best customers for his contraband articles. One lady, upon hearing my business, seized hold of the poker with one hand and her salts bottle with the other. A second was also nearly fainting and rang the bell for her maid to bring her some eau de cologne, the very eau de cologne which my father had smuggled for her. A third begged me with tears in her eyes to retire, or my very suspicious appearance would frighten her lapdog into fits. And a fourth, an old lady, who was my father's best customer for French brandy, held up her hands to heaven and implored the Lord to protect her from all Sabbath breakers, profane swearers, and drunkards. Finding that I had nothing to expect from the ladies, I tried the gentleman who had been accustomed to patronize my father previous to his misfortune. The first swore at me like a trooper and assured me that he had always prophesied I should go wrong. The second spoke civilly and regretted that his excellent advice had been all thrown away upon my father, whom he had vainly endeavored to avert from his wicked courses. It was for smuggling things for this gentleman that my father had been arrested. And the third made no direct answer, but shook his head solemnly and wondered what the world was coming to. I was now really reduced to despair. I, however, resolved to try some of the very poorest tradesmen in the town, but these miserable creatures I was received by these miserable creatures I was received with compassionate interest, and my case was fully comprehended by them. Some even gave me a few halfpence, and one made me sit down and dine with him, his wife, and his children. They, however, one and all declared that they could not take me into their service, for if they did, they would be sure to offend all their customers. Th thus was it that the overbearing conduct and atrocious tyranny of the more wealthy part of the community compelled the poorer portion to smother all sympathy in my behalf. A sudden thought now struck me. I resolved to call next day upon the very baronet who had himself suffered so much in consequence of the customs laws. 
Accelerated by the new hope awakened within me, I repaired on the following morning to the splendid mansion which he now inhabited. I was shown into a magnificent room where he received me lounging before a cheerful fire. He listened very patiently to my tale and then spoke as nearly as I can recollect as follows. My good lad, I have not the slightest doubt that you are anxious to eat the bread of honesty as you very properly express it, but that bread is not within the reach of everybody. And if we were all to pick and choose in this world, what would become of us? My dear young man, I occupy a prominent position amidst the gentry of these parts, and I have also a duty to fulfill towards society. Society has condemned you unheard, I grant you. Nevertheless, society has condemned you. Under these circumstances, I have no alternative but to decline t taking you into my service, and I must moreover request you to remember that if you are ever found loitering upon my grounds, I shall have you put in the stocks. I regret that my duty to society sunspots me thus to act. So basically he's like, yes, I know that you're innocent and people are treating you badly, but that is just the lot of life for some people and it must be yours. You may conceive with what feelings I heard this long tirade. I was literally confounded and retired without venturing upon a remonstrance. I knew not what course to adopt. To return home and inform my parents that I could obtain no work was to lay myself under the necessity of becoming a smuggler and a body snatcher at once. As a desperate resource, I thought of calling upon the clergyman and explaining all my sentiments to him. I hoped to be able to convince him that although my father was bad or supposed to be bad, yet I abhorred vice in all its shapes and was anxious only to pursue honest courses. As a Christian minister, he could not, I imagined, be so uncharitable as to infer my guilt in consequence of that of my parent. And accordingly to him did I repair. Oh, this isn't going to go well. He had just returned to his own house from a funeral and was in a hurry to be off on a shooting excursion, for he had on his sporting garb beneath his, beneath his surplice. He listened to me with great impatience and asked if my father still pursued his contraband trade. Seeing that I hesitated how to reply, he, explained, he exclaimed, turning his eyes up to the heavens, Speak the truth, young man, and shame the devil. I answered in the affirmative, and he then said carelessly, Well, go and speak to my wife. She will act in the manner as she chooses. Rejoice at this hopeful turn in the proceeding, I sought this lady as I was desired. She heard all that I had to say and then observed, not for worlds could I receive you into my house again, but if your father has any skills, said silks, gloves, very cheap and very good, I do not mind purchasing them. And remember, she added as I was about to depart, I do not want these things. I only offer to take them for the purpose of doing you a service. My motive is a purely Christian one. So, no, I won't help you, but if your dad has any more st smuggled goods, I'd buy them from him. For your sake, of course. I returned home. Well, said my father, what luck this morning? None, I replied. And what do you mean to do, lad? To become a smuggler, a body snatcher, or anything else that you choose, was my reply. And the sooner we begin, the better, for I am sick and tired of being good. So I became a smuggler and a resurrection man. You have heard, perhaps, that Deal is famous for its boatmen and pilots. It is also renowned for the beauty of the sailor's daughters. One of those lovely creatures captivated my heart, for I can talk sentimentally when I think of those times, and she seemed to like me in return. Her name was Catherine Price, Kate Price, as she was called by her acquaintances, and a prettier creature the sun never shone upon. She was good and virtuous, too, and she alone understood my real disposition, which even now that I had embarked in lawless pursuits, still wanted to be good and virtuous also. At this time I was 19 and she was one year younger. We loved in secret, we met in secret, for her parents would not for one moment have listened to the idea of our union. My hope was to obtain a sum of money by one desperate venture in the contraband line and run away with Kate to some distant part of the country where we could enter upon some way of business that would produce us an honest livelihood. This hope sustained us. At this time there was a great many sick sailors in Deal Hospital and numerous funerals took place in the burial ground of that establishment. My father and I determined to have up a few of the corpses, for we always knew where to dispose of as many subjects as we could obtain. By these means I proposed to raise enough money to purchase in France the articles that I meant to smuggle into England and thereby, thereby obtain the necessary funds for carrying out the plans upon which Kate and myself were resolved. Good luck, attend good luck attended upon my father and myself in respect to the body snatching business. We raised 30 pounds, and with that we set sail for France in the boat which we always hired for our smuggling expeditions. We landed at Calais and made our purchases. We bought an immense quantity of brandy at 10 pence a quart, gloves at 8 pence a pair, and three watches at 2 pounds 10 each, and some eau de cologne proportionately cheap. Our 30 pounds we calculated would produce us 120. 
We put out to sea again at about 10 o'clock at night. The wind was blowing stiff from the northeast, and by the time we had been an hour at sea, it increased to a perfect hurricane. Never shall I forget that awful night. The entire ocean was white with foam, but the sky above was as black as pitch. We weathered the tempest until we reached the shore about a mile to the southward of Walmer at a place called Kingsdown. We touched the beach. I thought everything was safe. A huge billow broke over the stern of the lugger, and in a moment the boat was a complete wreck. My father leapt on shore from the bow at the instant this catastrophe took place. I was swallowed up along with the ill-fated bark. I was, however, an excellent swimmer. I combated and fought and struggled with the ocean as a man would wrestle with an animal that held him in his grasp. I succeeded in gaining the beach, but so weak and enfeebled was I that my father was compelled to carry me to our hovel close by. I was put to bed. A violent fever seized upon me. I became delirious, and for six weeks I lay tossing upon a bed of sickness. At length I got well, but what hope remained for me? We were totally ruined. So was the poor fisherman whose boat was wrecked upon that eventful night. I wrote a note to Kate to tell her all that had happened and to make an appointment for the following Sunday evening that we might meet and talk over the altered aspect of affairs. Scarcely had I dispatched the, this letter to the care of Kate's sister-in-law, who was in our, in our secret and managed our little correspondence, when my father came in and asked me if I felt myself well enough to accompany him on a little expedition that evening. I replied in the affirmative. He then told me that a certain surgeon for whom we did business who and who resided in Deal required a particular subject which had been buried that morning in Walmer Churchyard. I did not ask my father any more questions, but that night I accompanied him to the burial ground between 11 and 12 o'clock. The sur surgeon showed my father the grave in the afternoon. We had a cart waiting in a lane close by. Uh, the church is in a secluded part, surrounded by trees, and at some little distance from any habitations. There was no danger of being meddled with. Moreover, we had often operated in the same ground before. To work we went in the usual manner. We shoveled out the soil, broke open the coffin, thrust the corpse into a sack, filled up the grave once more, and carried our prize safe off to the cart. When we then set off at a round pace toward the deal, and arrived at the back door of the surgeon's house by two o'clock, he was up and waiting for us. We carried the corpse into the surgery and laid it upon a table. You are sure it is the right one, said the surgeon. It is the great body from the grave that you pointed out, answered my father. The fact is, resumed the surgeon, that this is a very peculiar case. Six days ago, a young female rose in the morning in perfect health. That evening, she was a corpse. Oh, no, I'm worried. Okay. I opened her and found no traces of poison, but her family would not permit me to carry the examination any further. They did not wish her to be hacked about. Since her death, some love letters have been found in her drawer, but there is no name attached to any of them. I began to feel interested. I scarcely knew why, but this was the manner in which I was accustomed to write to Kate. The surgeon continued, I am therefore anxious to make another and more searching investigation than on the former occasion into the cause of death, but I will soon satisfy myself that this is indeed the corpse I mean. With these words, the sur surgeon tore away the shroud from the face of the corpse. I cast an anxious glance upon the pale, cold marble countenance. My blood ran cold. My legs trembled. My strength seemed to have failed me. Was I mistaken? Could it be the beloved of my heart? Yes, that is Miss Price, said the surgeon coolly. All doubt on my part was now removed. I had exhumed the body of her whom a thousand times I had pressed to my sorrowful breast, whom I had clasped my aching heart. I felt as if I had committed some horrible crime, a murder or other or other deadly deed. Oh, I mean, the resurrection man is a terrible person who's been murdering people. But that is so sad. Oh. Okay. Wow. The surgeon and my father did not notice my emotions, but settled their accounts. The medical man then offered us each a glass of brandy. I drank mine with avidity and then accompanied my father from the spot, uncertain whether to rush back and claim the body or not, but I did not do so. For some days I wandered about scarcely knowing what I did and certainly not caring what became of me. One morning I was roving amidst the fields when I heard a loud voice exclaimed, exclaim, I say, you fellow there, open the gate, will you? I turned around and recognized the baronet on horseback. He had a large hunting whip in his hand. Open the gate, said I, and for whom? And whom for? Whom for, repeated the baronet. Why, for me, to be sure, fellow. Then open it yourself, said I. The baronet was near enough to me to reach me with his whip, and he dealt me a stinging blow across the face. 
Maddened with pain and soured with vexation, I leapt over the gate and attacked the baronet with a stout ash stick which I carried in my hand. I dragged him from his horse and thrashed him without mercy. When I was tired, I walked quietly away, he roaring after me that he would revenge upon me as sure as I was born. Next day, I was arrested and taken before a magistrate. The baronet appeared against me and, to my surprise, swore that I had assaulted him with a view to rob him and that he had the greatest difficulty in protecting his person watch. I told my story and showed the mark of the baronet's whip across my face. The justice asked me if I could bring forward any witnesses to character. The baronet exclaimed, how can he? He has been in Dover Castle for smuggling. Never, I cried emphatically. Well, your father has then, said the baronet. This I could not deny. Oh, it, that's just the same thing, cried the magistrate, and I was committed to jail for trial at the next Maidstone Assizes. For three months I lay in prison. I was not, however, completely hardened yet, nor did I associate with those who drank and sang and swore. I detested vice in all its shapes, and I longed for an opportunity to be good. It may seem strange to you who know me now to hear me speak thus, but you are not aware of what I was then. I was tried and found guilty. The next two years of my life I passed in the hulks of Woolwich, dressed in dark gray and wearing a chain around my leg. Even there I did not grow so corrupt, but that I sought for work the moment I was set at liberty again. I resolved not to return home to my parents, for I detested the ways into which they had led me. Turned away from the hulks one fine morning at ten o'clock, without a farthing in my pocket, nor the means of obtaining a morsel of bread, my prospects were miserable enough. I could not obtain any employment in Woolwich. Evening was coming on, and I was hungry. Suddenly I thought of enlisting. Pleased with this idea, I went to the barracks and offered myself as a recruit. The regiment stationed there was about to embark for the East Indies in a few days and wanted men. Although certain of being banished, as it were, to, an utmost, to a most unhealthy climate for 21 years, I preferred that to the life of a vagabond or a criminal in England. The sergeant was delighted with me because I could read and write well, but the surgeon would not pass me. He said, you have either been half starved for, length, for a length of time or you have undergone a long imprisonment for your flesh is as flabby as possible. Thus was this hope destroyed. Now what pains had the law taken to make me good, even supposing that I was really bad at the time of my condemnation? The law locked me up for two years, half starved me, and yet exacted from me as much labor as a strong, healthy man could have performed. Then the law turned me out into the wide world, so weak, reduced, and feeble, that even the last resource of the most wretched, namely enlisting in a regiment bound for India, was closed against me. Well, that night I wandered into the country and slept under a hedge. On the following morning, I was compelled to satisfy the ravenous cravings of my hunger with Swedish turnips plucked from the fields. This food lay so cold upon my stomach that I felt ready to drop with illness, misery, and fatigue. And yet, in this Christian land, even that morsel, against which my heart literally heaved, was begrudged me. I was not permitted to satisfy my hunger with the food of beasts. A constable came up and took me into custody for robbing the turnip field. I was conducted before a neighboring justice of the peace. He asked me what I meant by stealing the turnips. I told him that I had fasted for 24 hours and was hungry. Nonsense, hungry, he exclaimed. I'd give five pounds to know what hunger is. You kind of fellows eat turnips by way of luxury, you do, and not because you're hungry. I assured him that I spoke the truth. Well, why don't you go to work, he demanded. So I will, sir, with pleasure, if you will give me employment, I replied. Give you employment, he shouted. I wouldn't have such a fellow about me if he'd work for nothing. Where did you sleep last night? Under a hedge, sir, was my answer. I thought so, he exclaimed, a rogue and vagabond, evidently. And this excellent specimen of the great unpaid committed me forthwith to the treadmill for one month as a rogue and a vagabond. The treadmill is a horrible punishment. It is too bad even for those that are real rogues and vagabonds. The weak and the strong take the same turn without any distinction, and I have seen men fall down fainting upon the platform with the risk of having their legs or arms smashed by the wheel through sheer exhaustion. Then the miserable fare that one and the miserable fare that one receives in prison renders him more fit for a hospital than for the violent labor of the treadmill. I had been two years at the Hulks and was not hardened. I had been a smuggler and a body snatcher and was not hardened. But this one month's imprisonment and spell at the treadmill did harden me, and hardened me completely. I could not see any advantage in being good. I could not find out any inducement, to be honest. As for a desire to lead an honorable life, that was absurd. I now laughed the idea to, sw to scorn, and I swore within myself that whenever I did commence a course of crime, I would be an unsparing demon at my work. Oh, how I then detested the very name of virtue. The rich look upon the poor as degraded reptiles that were born in infamy and that cannot possibly possess a good instinct. I reasoned within myself. 
Let a rich man accuse a poor man before a justice, a jury, or a judge, and see how quick the poor wretch is condemned. The aristocracy hold the lower classes in horror and abhorrence. The legislature thinks that if it does not make the most grinding laws to keep down the poor, the poor will rise up and commit the most unheard of atrocities. In fact, the rich are prepared to believe any infamy which is imputed to the poor. It was thus that I reasoned, and I looked forward to the day of my release with a burning, maddening, drunken joy. That day came. I was turned adrift as before, without a shilling and without a crust. That alone was as bad as branding the words rogue and vag vagabond upon my forehead. How could I remain honest, even if I had any longer been inclined to do so, when I could not get work and had no money, no bread, no lodgings? The legislature does not think of all this. It fancies that all its duty consists in punishing men for crimes and never dreams of adopting measures to prevent them from committing crimes at all. But I now know more... I now no more thought of honesty. I went out of prison a confirmed ruffian. I had no money, no conscience, no fear, no hope, no love, no friendship, no sympathy, no kindly feeling of any sort. The very first thing I did was to cut myself a good tough ash stick with a heavy knob at one end. The next thing I did was to break into the house of the very justice who had sentenced me to the treadmill for eating a raw turnip. And I feasted jovially upon the cold fowl and ham which I found in his larder. I also drank success to my new career in a bumper of his fine old wine. This compliment was due to him. He had made me what I was. I carried off a small quantity of plate, all that I could find, you may be sure, and took my departure from the house of the justice. As I was hurrying away from this scene of my first exploit, I passed by a fine large burn, also belonging to my friend, the magistrate. I did not hesitate a moment what to do. I owed him a recompense for my month at the treadmill, and I thought I might as well add incendiary to my other titles of rogue and vagabond. Besides, I longed for mischief. The world had persecuted me quite long enough. The hour of retaliation had arrived. I fired the barn and scampered away as hard as I could. I halted at a distance of about a half a mile and turned to look. A bright column of flame was shooting up to heaven. Oh, how happy I, did I feel in that moment. Happy, this is not the word. I was mad, intoxicated, delirious with joy. I literally danced as I saw the barn burning. I was avenged on the man who would not allow me to eat a cold turnip to save me from starving. That one cold turnip cost him dear. The fire spread and communicated with his dwelling house, and there was no adequate supply of water. The barn, the stacks, the outhouses, the mansion were all destroyed, but that was not all. The only daughter of the justice, a girl of 19, was burnt to death. I read the entire account in the newspapers a few days afterwards. Man, this is getting tough quick, isn't it? And the upper classes wonder that there are so many incendiary fires. My only surprise is that, there's, is that there are so few. Ah, the Lucifer match is a fearful weapon in the hands of a man whom the laws, the aristocracy, and the present state of society have ground down to the very dust. I felt all my power. I knew all my strength. I was aware of all my importance as a man when I read the awful extent of misery and desolation which I had thus caused. Oh, I was signally avenged. I now bethought me of punishing the baronet in the same manner. He had been the means of sending me for two years to the hulks at Woolwich. Pleased with this idea, I jogged merrily on towards Walmer. It was late at night when I reached home. I found my mother watching by my father's deathbed and arrived just in time to behold his, him breathe his last. My mother spoke to me about decent interment for him. I laughed in her face. Had he ever allowed anyone to sleep quietly in his grave? No. How could he then hope for repose in the tomb? My mother remonstrated. I threatened to dash out her brains with my stout ash stick, and on the following night I sold my father's body to the surgeon who had anatomized poor Kate Price. This was another vengeance on my part. Not many hours elapsed before I set fire to the largest bon barn upon the baronet's estate. I waited in the neighborhood and glutted myself with a view of the conflagration. The damage was immense. The next day I composed a song upon the subject, which I have never since forgotten. You may laugh at the idea of me becoming a poet, but you know well enough that I received some trifle of education, that I was not a fool by nature, and that in early life I was fond of reading. The baronet suspected that I was the cause of the fire, as I had just returned to the neighborhood, and he had me arrested and taken before a justice. But there was not a shadow of proof against me, nor a pretense to keep me in custody. I was accordingly discharged with an admonition to take care of myself which was as much as to say, if I can find an opportunity of sending you to prison, I will. Walmer and its neighborhood grew loathsome to me. The image of Kate Price constantly haunted me, and I was moreover shunned by everyone who knew that I had been at the Hulks. 
I accordingly sold off all the fishing tackle and other traps and came up to London with the old mummy. I need say no more. And there's enough in your history to set a man a-thinking, exclaimed the waiter of the boozing ken. There is indeed. I believe you, there is, observed the cracksman, draining the pot which had contained the egg flip. The clock struck midday when Holford entered the parlor of the boozing ken. Okay, that's that chapter. Now, whether or not all of that history is going to play a role in the story moving forward, or if it is an another instance of the author speaking up against the plight of the poor, because a lot of Penny Dreadful authors did, they spoke about the things that faced so many of those who read their stories. Um, I don't know, but there's a little history of the Resurrection Man, which what brought him to where he is, and the kind of things that so many people faced um, at that time, and unfortunately still face today, so... Anyway, there we are. Holford has just reached the boozing ken, and I bet we're going to find out what they're up to next with the palace. So, see you for the next chapter. Mm -hmm.